Good. How are you doing? I can't think you can use those. Can you use them? Hoping to use them at the library. Since retiring from a career as a financial executive, Jim Mackin has devoted himself to his lifelong interest in his native city. He's not only an expert in New York's history, in New York's history, but also his art, music, literature, and culture. Jim has a detailed knowledge of New York's borough, blocks, and streets. And that's not just because he's run five marathons. As the founder of Jim Mackin's weekday walks, He's led groups on deeply researched and thorough 
currently fascinating tours of neighborhoods throughout the five boroughs, with occasional excursions to Jersey City, Hobo, and Yonkers. He's an active, he's active in volunteer work for several New York City organizations. In addition to serving as a board member of our own Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group, he has taught at the university level, given tours for the New York Historical Society, and is the past president of the rolling chapter of the Society for Industrial Archaeology and National Organization. His talk today covers a particularly interesting aspect of Bloomingdale and Upper West Side history, its role as a location of pioneering institutions in the fields of health care and medical research. And for you, Jim Mack. Thank you very much. And if we don't have your email address, uh, please leave it in the back because we'll keep you in touch with the future programs. We, we uh, promise you that all of our programs will be free. It will always be free. And that's why we have a little uh, thing in the back that we appreciate very token uh, donations. As some of you may know, President Obama lived in the neighborhood on West 109th Street. And we have a fantasy that we would actually uh, contact the executive office and have him come back and do a presentation here. <laughs> and to, to do that, it's going to take money. So, uh, token appreciation is much, uh, much appreciated. Um, so, if you want to see the latest member of our Bloomingdale neighborhood, Plowshares Coffee, right down the block, just uh, picked up on the name. And now let's start with some hospitals. Anybody recognize this hospital? This building is on the northwest corner of West End Avenue and 72nd Street. It was built in the mid-1920s and planned to be a cancer hospital with 300 beds to be called Alta Vista Hospital. The $5 million of funding that was needed didn't materialize there's no hospital. Today it's an apartment building. Here's another hospital that we're not going to talk about. Anybody recognize this hospital? Nobody. This is 170 West 76th Street and was the Park West Hospital established in 1926 with 75 beds and it was connected to the Park East Hospital on East 83rd Street with 130 beds. They were originally for the care of wealthy patrons. In 1933, a man who was known as the father of jazz guitar, anybody know the name Eddie Lang? He died in that hospital, and as he was dying, his close friend held him in his arms and cried. His close friend, they were back in 1933, was Dean Crosby. Here's another hospital. Anybody recognize this? I'll give you a clue, Central Park North. You may recognize on the right side the new high rise on Central Park North in the corner of Malcolm X Boulevard or Lennox Boulevard or continuation of 6th Avenue. This is how it looked when it opened in 1929. This is Parkway Hospital. Somebody said that. Excellent. Um, by the 1950s, it was known as Italian Hospital. Um, and was fully functioning into the early 1970s. In 1996, Dr. Lorraine Hale purchased the building for her Hale House. Let's try another one. If you walk east of Conservatory Garden in Central Park, you'll see a rock with a plaque on it. That's the rock, that's the plaque. I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit. And you might be able to see yet another hospital. And if you wander around a little bit, you'll see this wall. This wall supported a military hospital whose official name was the U.S. General Hospital Central Park. But it was sometimes called St. Joseph's Military Hospital. That name came from the religious order Sisters of Charity who provided nursing staff and who established Mount St. Vincent Academy in 1947. And this is what it looked like when it operated as a hospital for Civil War soldiers. Actually, 
actually, well, the building's not in Central Park. It burned in a fire in the uh, 1880s. But following the Civil War, the buildings uh, and the site became a sculpture museum and restaurant called uh, variously Mount St. Vincent Hotel, uh, Stetson Hotel, and the Gowans Pass Tavern. Today, the Central Park Conservancy uses the site as a composting area. Now, I'm saying Vincent Academy moved to the Bronx, and if you've ever had the pleasure of seeing that building, again, this is up in the Bronx, and that still exists today. And here's the famous Dr. Valentine Mott. Dr. Valentine Mott, uh, considered to be the father of vascular surgery, was the most renowned surgeon of his day in New York City. He was educated in Columbia, was the founder of Rutgers Medical College, was on the founding faculty of what became NYU Medical College. He was also a president of the New York Academy of Medicine. And we have with us today from the New York Academy of Medicine, Paul Thierman. Paul, can you raise your hand? Yep. Thank you. And uh, his grandson, also named Dr. Valentine Mott, studied under Louis Pasteur and was the first to introduce rabies vaccine into the United States. Dr. Valentine Mott lived at number one Gramercy Park, but he had a country house in our neighborhood on Bloomingdale Road in what would be today 93rd Street. <laughs> so, let us begin to showcase the medical institutions in our Bloomingdale neighborhood, because we haven't done any yet. They all have interesting histories, they're all greatly significant, and will make you proud of being connected to our Bloomingdale neighborhood legacy. But first, we need to adjust your expectations. If you expect that we will present three, maybe four, or maybe even five medical institutions in the Bloomingdale neighborhood, we ask you to have an open mind. And now let's get started, because we have a lot to tell you about. Anyone recognize this hospital? This is a building on Central Park West between 88th and 89th Street. It's still there today. The Charles B. Towns Hospital was a substance abuse hospital. Towns was an insurance salesman from Georgia, he came to New York City in 1901, became a partner in a brokerage firm that failed. And he claimed to have come up with a, res a recipe um, from a country doctor that enabled a cure from substance abuse in, quote, less than five days, and with no suffering. Since Towns wasn't a doctor, he partnered with Dr. Alexander Lambert, who had years of experience at Bellevue and was considered an expert on alcoholism. Dr. Lambert was also Teddy Roosevelt's personal physician. The town's hospital centered on the well-to-do alcoholics. One patient was William Griffith Wilson. Anybody recognize that name? During his treatment, William Griffin Wilson, Wilson witnessed a blinding light and felt it as an ecstatic sense of freedom and peace. This led Mr. Wilson, more generally known as Bill W., to abstain from alcohol for the remaining 36 years of his life and become co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. So we've got one of our nine medical institutions. Let's go on to the next one. Everybody knows the Metro <laughs> You laugh, but let me call your attention to the Queen Anne-style house on the left side of the picture. And I'll give you a better image of that. 223 West 100th Street. That was built as a private residence in 1889. In 1894, it was sold by auction to become the New York Red Cross Hospital. Soon after, the Red Cross Hospital occupied 110 West 82nd Street. That building is not there anymore. That's where the um, 20th Precinct uh, complex is. Um, 
In 1898, the entire staff and nurses and doctors volunteered from, from that hospital, volunteered to go to Cuba to attempt to the sick and wounded in the Spanish-American War. From that, they, they learned some um, uh, critical lessons because in 1906, on a 99 by 100 foot lot on the southwest corner of Central Park West and 100th Street, the cornerstone was laid for a brand new New York Red Cross Hospital. The lot cost $90,000 and was a gift from William T. Wardwell. Wardwell was a retired treasurer of Standard Oil Company. He ran for mayor and governor on the Prohibition Party ticket. His stepson, Alan Wardwell, became a renowned attorney and namesake of the law firm Davis Polk Wardwell. In 1910, the Red Cross Hospital Training School for Nurses graduated five nurses. In 1915, the name was changed to Park Hospital. Here's a map where you can see kind of on the upper right hand side that Park Hospital on the corner of 100th Street and Central Park West. Notice St. Jude's Chapel in the middle there, which we occasionally touch upon in our local history with, uh, in conjunction with uh, St. Michael's Church. But in 1921, it became renowned for employing techniques learned from World War I to reconstruct bodies, that is, rehabilitate soldiers who returned from the war. So it merged with the dispensary um, and the clinic for functional re-education and was renamed Reconstruction Hospital. As such, and at the time, it was the only one of its kind in the entire country. In 1929, it merged with New York Postgraduate Medical School. Uh, at the time, it was on 20th Street and 2nd Avenue. So here's the same map, or a different map, different time period, showing the name Red Cross Hospital there. Reconstruction Hospital was absorbed into NYU in 1948. Just before urban renewal, it was torn down, and it was obviously on the site of what is today Park West Village. In the last year before it was torn down, 1954-55, the 24th Precinct used it as their operating facility, in effect their precinct house, because their building from 1869 was being torn down and replaced with a modern building. So here's a photograph of the reconstruction hospital. Again, southwest corner of 100th Street and Central Park West. Let's move on. So we've got two medical institutions. The two great medical advances of the modern age, in, in my simple mind, are anesthesia and germ theory. With all the attention to uh, Ebola these days, we forget how, until the late 1800s, we had little understanding of diseases. Then along came Robert Koch, Joseph Lister, and Louis Pasteur. In 1885, four boys from Newark, New Jersey were bit by a rabbit dog and were expected to die. Instead, they were sent to Paris to be treated by Louis Pasteur. And this book by Bert Hansen, and Bert's in our, in our uh, audience today. Bert, can I tell you to raise your hand? Yep. This is Bert's book. This is one of my favorite all-time books. If you haven't read this, you'll You'll read the story of the four Newark boys, Louis Pasteur, and much, much more. It's, it's, it's so germane for us to understand how significant this was for medical history in all of the United States. And, and Bert just goes a, um, tells a riveting tale here. This amazing book shows how Pasteur's treatment of the Newark boys made medical medicine major news, uh, how medicine became popular history, and how this changed our attitudes about medicine, doctors, and medical institutions. I was actually at the Newark Historical Society last Monday evening, and I brought this topic up, being able to brag that I had read your book, and uh, uh, they, they're going to try to figure out how to run with this, because th this is a key part of Newark history as, as well as our history. But here's a photograph of uh, Dr. Paul Gilbert, uh, who would become known um, as, the, as, as being primary in introducing antitoxin for treatment of diphtheria in the United States. Um, 
and also for introducing anti-venomous serum for snake bites in, into the United States. Um, Mr. Hansen's book, Picturing Medical Progress from Yesterday to Polio, cites Paul Gilbert as, quote, the U.S.'s first scientific impresario, end of quote, force, quote, single-handedly building a new kind of institution, an independent laboratory with the capacity for research, development, and production for the new biological cures, end of quote. So then, in 1890, Dr. Paul Gilbert, after, and of course he was a student of Louis Pasteur, founded the Pasteur Institute at 178 West 10th Street, um, and uh, that's gone. That, that's gone since they widened Seventh Avenue for the RT subway. But on October 4th, 1892, numerous dignitaries, including then Mayor Hugh Grant, were present as the cornerstone was laid on a new five-story building, uh, costing approximately fifty thousand dollars and having fifty beds. And that is, of course. It's when referred to the Pasteur Institute. You can see a little bit of faded wording there, kind of in the middle. That, that would have been on the corner of Central Park West and 97th Street. So in 2004, a local resident, who many of us know as the director and guiding force of Bloomingdale Aging in Place, the executive director of the Pasteur Foundation of the United States, um, Caitlin Hawk. Caitlin? Can we acknowledge you over there? No? Okay. <laughs> uh, we would embarrass uh, Caitlin by telling you um, some of the honors she received from the government of France in conjunction with her work, but uh, we're, we're so honored that she's here this evening. And here's a picture of the Institute as it looked way back when, in 1890-something. So, um, We've got three of our institutions, three of our medical institutions. Let's, let's move on. And these are in no particular order. These are really more just in the order of which um, I did some research and, and threw some of my notes together. So, uh, in 1898, as we all know, Marie Curie and her husband, Pierre, discovered radium. Soon after, radium was being used to treat certain diseases, notably cancer. So before we identify our next hospital and healing place in the Bloomingdale neighborhood, um, here's a little bit of comic relief in the form of advertisements for the healthful use of radio. Before trying any of these, please consult me. <laughs> but I show these also in part to introduce the Radium Institute of New York was organized in 1914 and operated on West 70th Street as one of the pioneer radium laboratories in the country. It provided free treatment for patients suffering from cancer. Supposedly, at that time, there was eight ounces of radium in the world, of which three ounces was in the United States. The Radium Institute made the largest purchase of radium up to that time for $120,000. And radium at the time was selling for about $1,000 a gram, 28 grams to the ounce. And the Radium Institute was treating about 6,000 people a year when it moved into our Bloomingdale neighborhood. So you can see the brief uh, excerpt of the article simply says that they came to 323 Riverside Drive, which if you went there today, you would see this building. So that's on the site of where the Radium Institute got established. And here's what it looked like in its day. And indeed, it's the fourth building from the right, or the first townhouse behind the um, uh, apartment building 325 Riverside Drive. Um, the Radium Institute of New York occupied uh, this house uh, up until the 1920s, um, when there were some issues just with radium usage generally. So, we've got our next medical institution. 
And some of you may remember in this very room, we had a presenter, Michael Susi, and Michael did two presentations for us. One had to do with mansions on Riverside Drive, and the other one had to do with vestiges of the Bloomingdale Asylum from the insane as they were on the campus of Columbia University. So I'm going to talk about the Bloomingdale Asylum for the Insane, recognizing that this institution, like so many others that I'll touch upon, are really worthy of a presentation unto themselves. This institution began with the New York Hospital, which is the first hospital established in New York City, followed thereafter by Bellevue, St. Vincent's, and then St. Louis. But this was established in 1771. Soon after they established, um, they created a department to treat mentally ill patients separately in 1808. Uh, and those patients soon after that were segregated into a separate part of the hospital. This worked so well that the trustees of the hospital, and, and were back in the early 1800s, purchased, had the foresight to purchase 38 acres of the DePeister estate up in this Bloomingdale area. Um, in 1821, the Bloomingdale Asylum for the Insane opened. It was the second mental hospital in the entire United States, and by many accounts, it was considered the best in the country. I'll just show you how much it expanded over time. It was quite a large facility. It gives another perspective on it, just from the standpoint of looking at a map. The connected buildings there are to this day in a larger footprint than any particular building probably on Columbia's campus. Here's a uh, photograph from the Broadway side. So this is like from Broadway and 117th Street. And here's a photograph uh, from the front. Again, just to give you a sense of the other size. Um, the history of the Bloomingdale Asylum for the Insane with famous physicians, patients, newspaper exposés, critical reviews by Dorothy Dix, uh, as I said, would really make for a wonderful future presentation. By the late 1880s, there was much pressure on the Bloomingdale Asylum to move out of our neighborhood so that the area could be developed into residential buildings. A lot of it had to do with creating streets through the property and even subsequent Columbia's campus, as some of us might know, 116th Street was actually cut through as a street and then later on uh, closed off. The real estate interest argued that the Bloomingdale Asylum was not a charitable entity, but rather profitable and was, quote, simply a house for aristocratic lunatics. <laughs> that was the argument that they, uh, that they used. And part of that story is this building. A lot of you may recognize this building on Columbia's campus. Sometimes it's called um, Maison Francais, sometimes it's called Yule Hall. Um, and uh, I know it historically as the Macy Villa. Um, architect Ralph Townsend de designed this in 1885 um, as to house wealthy male patients at the Bloomingdale Asylum. Townsend decide, designed his own house the same year, 1885, that was moved from West End Avenue to 302 West 102nd Street, where it stands today. When we do walks in the neighborhood, we, we sometimes point that out. Um, Macy um, refers to William H. Macy, not, not the actor, obviously, um, but at the time, the son of Josiah Macy, the Josiah Macy Foundation is connected with a medical philanthropy. Um, and he was also a cousin to Roland, uh, or, or to R.H. Macy. Uh, and he was president and board of governors of the Bloomingdale um, Asylum for the Insane. Here's a picture of the Macy Villa before it was moved to its current location. So they actually had to move it to, to uh, build uh, Kent Hall. And there you can see 116th Street going through the property and to the right side is uh, Amsterdam Avenue with some telegraph poles and you could even see the trolley tracks uh, down the street there. That's Low Library. That's Low Library, the famous uh, Charles Fallon McKinnon Low Library. So we knocked off another medical institution and our next great neighborhood medical institution begins with this very remarkable man. 
William Augustus Muhlenberg. He was born Lutheran, but he converted to the Episcopal Church. He was the founder of St. Luke's Hospital. He's the great-grandson of Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, who's referred to as the, quote, father of Lutheranism in America, for which Muhlenberg College in Pennsylvania is named. His grandfather, Frederick Muhlenberg, was the first speaker of the House of Representatives in the United States. William Muhlenberg, that's the gentleman we're looking at here, was rector of the Church of the Holy Communion, whose church building from 1844 designed by Richard Upjohn, who did Trinity Church and many other things around the city, still stands down on 6th Avenue at about 21st Street or so. From, 18, uh, from 1983 to 2007, that church building was the Limelight Club. So if you have it down on 6th Avenue, you're, you're going back to the Muhlenberg uh, legacy. He was a giant in the field of education, and he established a school just north of Flushing in Queens that led to the area being called College Point, even though the college never got built or established out there. But St. Luke's the Hospital opened in 1858. As we said previously, it's the fourth oldest hospital in New York after Bellevue, St. Vincent's, and New York Hospital. And then, uh, at that time, it was on 5th Avenue and 54th Street. Let's take a quick look at that, just so you can get a size of it. Uh, how prominent this institution was in its day. Um, by the 1880s, the hospital had become inadequate. That's how successful it was. So it planned to move up to our neighborhood. Here's a photograph of St. Luke's under construction at the same time the Cathedral of St. John the Divine was underway. You can see the hospital on the right side there. And uh, you can see the cathedral being developed, being built underway. And on the left side is, and that's still there, is the 1843 Lincoln Watts Orphanage. That entire, with most of that structure is still intact on the cathedral close. The great architect, Ernest Flagg, was selected to design St. Luke's Hospital. In a few years, he would design the world's tallest building, the Singer Building. Um, and let's just take a quick look at that because this, for, for, for a while, was the largest building ever taken down. Um, but anyhow, with that kind of elegance, you could see what Ernest Flagg would do with St. Luke's Hospital. <laughs> the new St. Luke's Hospital opened in 1896 and was considered by many people to be the most magnificent hospital building in the whole country. Flagg's plan called for nine sections. I'll show you a photograph here that shows the first five, um, or the first seven, rather. This photograph just shows the first five sections. But here's a picture with uh, seven sections that were actually built. E each of them are very renowned um, uh, pavilions. The plan was to have nine sections built the last two being on Amsterdam Avenue, but um, they had to modernize, so, so that didn't happen. Um, so today, only five sections uh, remained. Um, the elegance of one of them, you can kind of see the Margaret J. Plant Pavilion. Margaret J. Plant was the husband of Henry Plant. If anybody knows any of this, I don't want to go to Pavilion by Pavilion, but Henry Plant you know, almost single-handedly developed Tampa, Florida by bringing a railroad down there, building eight hotels. Um, Margaret and Henry's son was Morton Plant. His mansion is still on Fifth Avenue. Today it's Cartier's, the, the jeweler. So um, that speaks to some interesting history. Um, the dome, uh, let's see, you can, you can still see this. I apologize for the uh, not so great photograph, but you can see some of uh, St. Luke's elegance from 100. 13th Street side. The dome is, uh, came off in the 1960s uh, with maintenance problems. In, uh, in 1888, St. Luke's School of Nursing was established and graduated 4,000 nurses over its 86 year life. Uh, how fitting then that the recent president of the hospital was not a physician but a nurse. 
At the start of this year, St. Luke's became part of the great legacy of Mount Sinai Hospital and is now proudly called Mount Sinai St. Luke's. Within the limits of this presentation, I'll just, uh, I'll just tell you a few of the accolades that are usually connected with uh, St. Luke's. In 1935, two surgeons, Dr. Henry Lyle and Dr. Alexander uh, Ada, performed one of the earliest successful removals of the cancerous lung. In 1939, St. Luke's acquired the first x-ray machine in New York uh, State. There were only 14 in the world at the time. In 1969, Dr. Van Mixke pioneered the development and use of ultrasound and ultrasound equipment. 1970, Dr. Richard McCray performed what is thought to be the first endoscopic gastric biopsy in the U.S. Uh, also in 1970, Dr. George Green developed and perfected the first coronary artery bypass surgery using the internal thoracic artery. In 1975, St. Luke's established the first hospital-based hospice program in the U.S. In 1982, Dr. Michael Reiko and Michael Lange published the first recognition of an unexplained immunological deficit in homosexual men, later to be discovered as HIV. And St. Luke's is sometimes thought to perform the first open heart surgery in, in New York City. So, we've uh, introduced you to six of the nine medical institutions that we're going to cover very surface parts today. So, as you can see, we have three to go. <clears throat> the next medical institution in the Bloomingdale neighborhood has been on 108th Street for a number of years. It has treated thousands of patients, and yet none of them could put into words what their symptoms were. <clears throat> and none of them were on Medicare or Medicaid. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> We're not going to count that in our nine medical institutions. We're going to get a little more serious, though. Um, let me take you to the corner, and there's a story behind this, to the corner of 76th Street and Madison Avenue. If you happen to be on that corner and you look northeast, you would see uh, the Carlisle Hotel with probably short uh, turf. But on the southeast corner, you'll see this building a little bit closer up, it looks like that. And I'll get even closer just to show you the entranceway. And above the canopy there, you can obviously see the caduceus, which is a dead giveaway for a medical institution. <coughs> Until the 1960s, this building was the Gotham Hospital. The Gotham Hospital was planned to be less affordable or more affordable than most hospitals because it was financed from an endowment in addition, women physicians ran the Gotham Hospital. So, here's the story. In the middle of the 1800s, only men could get educated and be employed in the medical profession, let alone be allowed to practice in the hospital. In 1863, the first medical college for women in New York City opened at 724 Broadway. In 1868, it purchased the building on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 12th Street for a college and a hospital. By 1888, the college had moved to 213 West 54th Street. Thank you for staying with me. In 1897, a new building was erected in our Bloomingdale community. So, take yourself to the corner of Central Park West and 101st Street. I'll help you along. If you know Central Park West, that's the northwest corner. And if you stand on the corner like I did with my $100 camera, I took a picture of a plaque that they just put up there. These are just some of the famous people that, this is typical of our Bloomingdale neighborhood, famous people that lived in that building. Or Blakely, the family of the jazz, the best of sort of. You probably know all the rest. You Parker, you know, somewhere over the rainbow, the Rain's Harbor, the Blue Moon, and much, much else with uh, Richard Rogers, etc. You can go on and on and on and on. But I draw your attention to that because if you go there and you walk down the block, 101st Street, 
you'll see that it's a little community garden. This is where the New York Medical College for Women and Hospital was located at 19 West 101st Street. In 1918, for the very first time, women doctors were accepted into city hospitals. And the women graduate physicians of the New York College, Medical College and Hospital for Women entered Bellevue Hospital, Willard Parker Hospital, and Cumberland Street Hospital. Cumberland's in the Brooklyn, but Willard Parker was on the East River. With that breakthrough, the New York Medical College for Women elected to close. The women students were transferred to the New York Homeopathic Medical College and Fifth Avenue Hospital, now Flower Fifth Avenue. And the proceeds of the sale of that property on West 101st Street became the endowment that was intended to finance the hospital wholly staffed by women physicians. It was planned to be nearby on Central Park West between 107th and 108th Street. But for a variety of reasons, the Gotham Hospital wound up on the corner of 76th Street and Madison Avenue. The New York Medical College for Women and Hospital was not very large, so I want to adjust your expectations here before I show you what it looked like. But it was the first medical college for women, and it was in our Bloomingdale neighborhood. So here's what it looked like. And that's it in the middle. It doesn't look like much, but. Ready for the next one? All right. The story of our next medical institution begins with another remarkable individual. The monument on Fifth Avenue across from the New York Academy of Medicine honors the founder of the first woman's hospital. And that is, of course, J. Marion Sims. In the middle of the 1800s, women's diseases were regarded as incurable and unmentionable. Doctors were admonished to look skyward while examining the female patients. I kid you not. James Marion Sims was a surgical pioneer, considered the father of American gynecology, and more generally, the world's leading authority on women's health. So you can see the um, image of him there. Sims developed a procedure to correct uh, vesicovaginal fistula, which was a condition that plagued women and made them social outcasts. It was usually the result of a traumatic labor. In addition to the correct and surgical procedures, Sims devised new instruments and an examination position that to this day is called the Sims position. He was also thought to be the first to use and advocate for silver wire for sutures instead of silk which tended to create infections. Sims arrived in New York in 1853, and by 1855 established the first hospital, only 30 beds, but the first hospital for women in the United States in a rented house on Madison Avenue and 29th Street. Here's a line image of it. As the hospital's reputation quickly grew, he hired Thomas Addis Emmett, to, to help staff and continue the hospital. Here's a picture of Emmett. He, he's worth, he, each one of these, Sims and Emmett, are, are worth an entire presentation. Um, Emmett would serve as a women's hospital, uh, serve at women's hospital for nearly 50 years to become its head in 1879. And he published the first comprehensive gynecology textbook. As the hospital grew so rapidly, the city of New York actually donated a full city block to the hospital, which is the current location of where the Waldorf Astoria is today on 49th and Park Avenue. Um, and then after some issues with, um, they, there was a cholera epidemic in New York City in 1932, and a lot of the people were buried on that site, so they had to be removed, and then the construction got underway. But by 1867, um, this building was put up, again, on the site of the Waldorf Astoria today. In 1892, um, the trustees of the Women's Hospital purchased land and moved up into our neighborhood so that in 1906, it was a brand new women's hospital 
at 141 West 109th Street. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, June, you do. Yeah, I, I occasionally run into people that um, say they were uh, born there. So, uh, quite an institution. Um, you can still see a vestige of that hospital, <laughs> but please, absolutely lower your expectations for this. There's a section of the wall behind the car there that's left over. Um, and to put that in a little more perspective, here's again an um, insurance map that just shows the layout um, of the women's hospital that was officially on West 109th Street. Um, but the, the images we saw were from Cathedral Parkway, 110th Street. Women's Hospital um, merged with St. Luke's Hospital in 1954, uh, and in 1964 moved on to the grounds uh, to become the Women's Division of St. Luke's. In 1968, the building was finally uh, taken down. Well, here's a little diversion. In 1926, possibly the largest crowd ever assembled on the Upper West Side formed. Anybody have any idea what that was all about? Largest crowd, I, I, I hypothesize, I could be wrong, but I think the largest crowd that ever assembled on the Upper West Side. So it wouldn't include Central Park, which has had concerts with um, you know, Simon and Garfunkel and uh, Diana Ross, they had supposedly half a million people. But on the Upper West Side in 1926, some estimate 50,000 people came to the funeral parlor on Broadway and 66th Street to mourn the heartthrob Rudolph Valentino. Whoops. Some, some of you might remember the old Campbell funeral home, but uh, we bring this up because he had just died in the Polyclinic Hospital. That building is still there on uh, West 50th Street. That was founded in 1912 by J. Marion Sims' son-in-law, John Allen White. Um, famous people like O. Henry died there. This is also the place, if anybody remembers the headline uh, uh, history, in the 1960s where uh, Joe DiMaggio visited the patient, Marilyn Monroe, his wife at the time, when she had a miscarriage and whole line of surgery. Um, and the reconstruction hospital that we talked about, they actually had to leave their hospital, 100th and Central Park West, in 1923 because of the water main break that destabilized the building. And they moved into this polyclinic hospital and actually operated for, for a few months. So, but let's move on to Sarah Platt Doremus. Um, this woman was instrumental in establishing not one, but two hospitals in the Bloomingdale neighborhood. At the beginning of the women's hospital back in the 1850s, she provided the largest source of funding for the hospital and then became president of its board. Uh, her family money was from Merchant, you know, the, the merchant business at the time, selling dry goods. The vice president, when she was president, but the vice president of the board of the women's hospital was also instrumental in establishing not the women's hospital, but this second hospital that they both had a part in establishing. And this vice president was Elizabeth Hamilton Cohen. We actually have a photograph of her. She was the widow of not one, but two Civil War generals, and was the granddaughter of Alexander Hamilton. An anonymous donor offered $200,000, an incredible amount at that time, to the women's hospital to erect a separate pavilion that would treat cancer cases. However, J. Marion Sims and, and his staff of physicians at the time were ambivalent about expanding the scope of the women's hospital into the realm of treating cancer. So the donor, whoops, the donor backed off. But Sarah Platt Doremus and Elizabeth Hamilton Cullen enlisted the support of the donor's wife, Charlotte Augusta Astor. 
with much determination, Elizabeth Hamilton Cullen rounded up all these donors, movers and shakers, and hosted a meeting in 1884 at her house, 261 Fifth Avenue, that established the first cancer hospital in the United States. And that's, of course, what we're looking at here at, at its early uh, stage. It was fitting that Elizabeth Hamilton Cullen laid the cornerstone uh, on May 17, 1884. Her grandmother, Alexander Hamilton's widow, Elizabeth Skyler Hamilton, was the congregant of St. Michael's Church, just uh, down the road here, um, when it opened in 1806 on the Bloomingdale Road on 99th Street. Just months after laying the cornerstone to the new hospital, Elizabeth Hamilton Cullen succumbed to uterine cancer. Just one week after the hospital's grand opening in 1887, Charlotte Augusta Astor, who was the primary driver behind the opening, wife of the primary benefactor, John Jacob Astor III, died of uterine cancer also. So, it's a picture of the Astors there. But this um, Astor is, the, is one of the children of the Mrs. Astor of the 400 fame. So the Astor family is very, um, very uh, large and complex. But um, in 1884, let's put this in, in general perspective. In 1884, former President Ulysses S. Grant, who was living at the time in, in Brownstone, 3 East 66th Street, developed throat cancer. This caught the attention of the entire nation. The cancer was considered incurable, contagious, and shameful. With the development of anesthesia, surgical, equipment, surgical treatment was possible in some cases, but unfortunately not for Grant. So he died in 1885. There are a few coincidental footnotes of history related to this in our area. <coughs> New York Mayor Hugh Grant supposedly showed and offered Grant's son, Frederick Grant, the Great Hill as the site for Grant's tomb. The Great Hill is the central park just across from the New York Cancer Hospital site. Also, Frederick Grant, just before he died, later on in 1912 from a heart attack, was surreptitiously being treated for throat cancer at St. Luke's Hospital. So, here's our rear cancer hospital. And this was designed by um, a very renowned architect in his day, Charles Coolidge uh, Haight, who also designed um, two or three buildings on Columbia's earlier campus. Um, but he also designed the General Theological Seminary, uh, designed some churches not too far from here, St. Ignatius and Antioch Church on West End Avenue and 87th Street. Uh, and he designed the Trinity School on West 91st Street. In 1890, the hospital expanded south into uh, its distinguished form like a French chateau. People often comment upon that. Highlighted by deep red brick with soft brown Belleville, New Jersey brownstone. And this includes the hospital's chapel of St. Elizabeth the Hungry, who is the patron saint of the suffering, which was dedicated to the memory of Elizabeth Hamilton Cullen. The expanded structure, as we know today, is often likened to this building. If anybody's had a pleasure in France, you kind of see the uh, general resemblance. In, um, Having a view, uh, well, what, let me show you one more thing. Because what's really going on with these towers is um, it, 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 it becomes a new part of hospital and institutional architecture. Um, the, the rounded towers and open spaces uh, facilitated ventilation, minimized corners where dirt and germs could collect. Um, but also uh, enable the uh, nurses to manage the wards and the, and the hospital beds much more efficiently. So, get a little sense of that here. Here's the floor plan from the hospital on, on one of the tower floors. And below it, you can see a picture from that period. And on the upper left side is a picture um, 
by the people who develop the hospital site and are, and are selling apartments there. Um, in 1899, the New York Cancer Hospital was renamed General Memorial Hospital for the Treatment of Cancer and Allied Diseases. Um, these photos just show its incredible elegance. This, this line drawing shows uh, patients going out into the park. That was thought to be very healthy for them. In fact, they even blasted the entrance into the park. If you've ever been at 106th Street in Central Park West, few people died in that blasting process. That was done primarily to accommodate the hospital taking people on uh, carriage rides. And here's some of the pictures that uh, many of us have had the good fortune of um, seeing this building up close. This is, of course, all after it's been redeveloped. And here's another map. Um, and with this, where that number 1841 was, was eventually converted into a nurse's residence. But I want to call your attention on the 105th Street side, you'll see a building whose address was 19 West 105th Street. And that was their X-ray laboratory that was completed in 1917. And sorry about this next picture, which is poor quality, but that building with the fire escapes is the one I'm referring to. There's some scaffolding there. But that was their laboratory. In 1921, uh, Marie Curie visited the hospital to see the brick and steel vault where the hospital kept its four grams of radium. At the time, it was supposedly the largest accumulation in the world in any one particular facility. There's much more interesting uh, history about how they had to truck it across town eventually over to what we know today as the Sloan Kettering Memorial History. So, because radiation treatments cause severe burns, and in some cases cause additional cancers, the hospital became a place that patients and the community feared. Earlier, the New York Cancer Hospital was renamed the General Memorial Hospital for the treatment of cancer and allied diseases. It is thought that the name change was due to relieve the perception that going to a cancer hospital meant that you were fated to die. Not to mention the fact that the hospital had a crematorium in the basement. In 1938, um, the General Memorial Hospital for the Treatment of Cancer and Allied Diseases moved out of Central Park West facility uh, to its new location on the east side where it became part of Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, Cancer Hospital. The New York Cancer Hospital was one of the two magnificent buildings in our Bloomingdale neighborhood that was almost lost. The other one, of course, is the very building we're in right now. Um, so we're so fortunate that the International Hospital provides this venue for the Bloomingdale Neighborhood History Group um, to do these presentations. Um, and we, we, with that, we thank them. And I thank Janet, my inspiration, and my love. And for all of your attention, for all of your attention and interest, we thank you. Thank you very much. And might anybody have any questions?
Yes, sir. Right. Uh, is that visible? It's not inside. It, it is visible. You have to scamper up the hill. But it's north of the composting area? Uh, it is the composting area. It's slightly north and east, if you don't mind scrambling around. And where is the Sims The Sims uh, Statue Memorial is on 103rd Street and 5th Avenue. It, there's, a, there's a companion Sims sculpture down in Montgomery, Alabama. From South Carolina, they practiced uh, originally in Montgomery. Uh, and full disclosure, you know, and, um, <laughs> what he had done. But they were slaves at the time, they didn't understand what happened. Well, one, one of them was willing. He actually re relieved her symptoms. The, 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 yeah, but, it, but it's, it's, we'll have to talk after. It's a big. Yes? Those of us who've lived in this neighborhood for a long time will remember when. Yeah. And then it fell into a terrible decay. And they were. I, I, I was trying to forget the uh, Bernard Bernman Towers nursing home scandal until Absolutely. you brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing is that when the building was at its, I guess, the depths of its decay, it was used as the setting for a horror film. Right. And in one of those turret rooms, under the turret, a horrible monster. <laughs> it was used for a few uh, movies, um, and I've got notes on that, and I think it was used as a training school for graffiti artists. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I'll uh, okay. guess. She's asking why, she's surprised that there wasn't a tuberculosis at the hospital area. Yeah, you, and you mean something on the order of like the Trudeau Institute of the Sarah, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I know some, some of them, uh, even the New York Cancer Hospital, having that veranda people out there in the fresh air and whatnot seems to suggest the tuberculosis type cure, but um, the tuberculosis was a specialty, I think. Yes? Uh, tuberculosis came in the century tended to end up with the sanitary or in the Jim, can you repeat some of that? Yeah, I'm afraid I, I, even I didn't hear the budget yet. But, uh, but do you know, was there a tuberculosis hospital in, a, in our neighborhood? I don't think so. No, no. He's, he's saying that the treatment was to send people to sanitarium outside. Outside. In Pope Arizona, in yep. Saturday Night Lake. But this is, this is really important in New York history and our history because it's connected to the student John Turnack, who gave the presentation last, earlier this, uh, this month, the last month, late last month. You're going to wait on this, John? <laughs> Please speak up.
question? So why don't we save that for a future presentation because it's a, it's a, it's a big elaborate story, it's an incredible book, obviously. And as you know, St. Luke's and Roosevelt came together as part of the whole continuum thing. So, so thank you for prompting us on, on that. Um, uh, I don't know offhand, yeah, sorry. It, um, you know, it conjures up uh, what some people have considered to be the greatest painting by an American, the um, Egan's, Thomas Egan's Gross Clinic. If you've ever seen that picture, you know, just, and I think that's the type of thing that we can operate here. Any other questions about the hospitals in our area or the others? Okay, I guess Paul. Thank you. 